The Sad Night, the story of an Aztec victory and a Spanish loss, by Sally Schaufer Matthews. Long ago in Mexico, when volcanoes sent lava rivers streaming into the jungles and jaguars hissed messages to man, a wandering people listened to their leaders. We must move again, the priest said. Put on your sandals and your robes and take your children by the hand and walk and keep on walking until you see an eagle on a cactus with a rattlesnake in its beak. In that place, we will build an empire. Every day they walked. To sleep, they curled up in their robes. To eat, they chopped up cactus and roasted rattlesnake meat. And one day, one very good day, they looked across a lake and saw an eagle on an island. It was perched on a cactus with a rattlesnake twisting around in its beak. They named the island Tecnochtitlan, which means the place of the cactus stone. We must make boats, the leader said, to get from here to the island. And when we live there, we'll travel on streets of water. And we must make our buildings tall enough to meet the sun, for the sun will light the way for us to become a noble people. The people worked hard. They built huge stone pyramids and put temples on top. They constructed palaces of stone with hundreds of rooms. They built causeways across the lake with bridges they could take away. They were safe. They were strong. They were the Aztecs. They began to want their neighbor's land. Ferocious Aztec warriors, the Jaguar Knights and the Eagle Knights, took over territory that belonged to other Indians and forced them to pay again and again to stay alive. The Aztecs had built an empire in less than 200 years. Everyone was afraid of them, and their king, Moctezuma, was the most powerful man in Mexico. Trouble for the Aztecs began in the year of 1 Reed, 1519. The king's men reminded him of the warning. Danger will come to us this year by boat, Royal Moctezuma. Our ancestors told us that the feathered serpent god would return to Mexico to take over our kingdom. They said that when he comes, Quetzalcoatl will not look like a feathered serpent, but like a man. If he takes over, what will become of us? Are we doomed? Royal Prince, what should we do? Quetzalcoatl is not a god of war, said Moctezuma. He wants poems and beauty and thoughtful, thoughtful words. Perhaps he comes to test us. I will wait, I will see, and then I will decide. For now, we will wait, and I will make an offering to the god. Hidden by the jungle, Aztec lookouts watched the biggest boats they had ever seen anchor on their shores. Soldiers wearing metal clothes crawled from the ships, then burned and sank the ships. The lookouts ran back over the mountains to Tecnoctitlan with the news. Quetzalcoatl and his army had arrived from the direction of the sunrise. But it was not Quetzalcoatl who had arrived on the eastern shore of Mexico. It was Hernan Cortez, a captain from Spain, sailing along the coast in search of gold and land. He and his small army had met some Indians who were friendly and some who had tried to chase them away. All were unhappy with the harsh Aztec rule. Moctezuma sent messages to the Spanish campsite with golden gifts for Quetzalcoatl. He hoped the god would be blessed, the Aztecs, and then go back home. But Cortes, realizing he had been mistaken for a god, began the long march to Tecnoctitlan. Again, Moctezuma chose important gifts from his treasury of gold and jewels, and he and his men met Cortes and his army on a causeway. Does a king fight a god? <laughs> Only if he wants to die. Moctezuma welcomed Cortes. Please consider my palaces your home. Come rest and eat. We are ready for you. The Spanish soldiers stared in amazement at the beauty of Tecnoctitlan and the noble Moctezuma in their golden presence. They asked one another, are we in heaven? Yet in the palace, the soldiers of Spain went to bed with their boots on, in full armor, clutching their weapons. Outside, the Aztec warriors whispered to one another that gods or not, the Spaniards seemed like enemies. On their march from the coast, Cortes and his army had killed many Indians with weapons no one had ever seen before. Cannons, guns, metal knives, dogs trained to attack, and horses that carried soldiers. The Aztec generals wanted Spanish blood to flow. Say the word, royal Moctezuma, they snarled, and before the sun leaves us today, we will slay these intruders as quickly as a jaguar pounces on a rabbit. Meanwhile, the Spanish soldiers complained to Cortes. There are thousands of Aztec warriors and only 400 of us. You must do something to protect us, sir. Please do it now. 
So Cortes, his captains, and Doña Marina, their Indian interpreter, marched to the royal palace. With strong, smooth words, they asked Moctezuma to come and stay with them as a hostage until they felt safe. Moctezuma did not want to go. You are my guests, he assured them. Therefore, you cannot be in danger. Afraid that their plan might fail, a Spanish soldier threatened to stab him. To prevent bloodshed, Doña Marina urged Moctezuma to go with them quickly. The king agreed, ordered his guards not to move, and went with Cortes. Though Moctezuma was still in command of Mexico, he was a prisoner. He turned over to Cortes all the gold in his treasury room. The Spaniards then melted the gold and gold jewelry into bars small enough to carry in their clothes. Moctezuma's advisors visited him often and tried to persuade him to leave. We can overpower them, they insisted, but the king refused. I will wait, he said. I will not fight Quetzalcoatl, and I will not fight a god. Aztec lookouts from the eastern coast ran to Moctezuma with an important message. Nineteen more Spanish ships had landed at Veracruz. Moctezuma told Cortes that more Spaniards had arrived, expecting him to be pleased. But Cortes knew the newcomers were not his friends. The king of Spain had sent troops to capture him, since he had burned his ships and acted on his own. Commanding an officer named Pedro de Alvarado to keep control in Tecnoctitlan, Cortes took some troops and left on horseback for Veracruz. He planned to defeat the new arrivals and then talk them into joining him in the search for more gold. Meanwhile, Alvarado gave the Aztecs permission to dance in a religious ceremony in front of the great temple. A huge crowd gathered, and Alvarado and his men, fearing an uprising, struck first. They slaughtered every priest, musician, and dancer in the courtyard. Moctezuma, shocked and angry, but still a prisoner, commanded his army to hold back. Wait until their leader returns, he said. I believe he will punish his soldiers for this act of war. You'll see. When Cortes returned, followed by an army of several thousand soldiers, he rode his horse along a deserted causeway. No procession came to greet him. No Aztec lords with gifts of gold. The heavy marching of his soldiers echoed down the streets. In the palace, Cortes raged at Alvarado for the slaughter, but there would be no pardon, for the Aztec warriors, outnumbered the Spaniards by thousands, swarmed over the rooftops and filled the streets, slinging rocks and attacking with clubs, arrows, spears, and fire. Take Moctezuma to the roof, Cortes ordered, and make him tell his people to stop. Tell them we'll leave peacefully. Turning his face from the Spaniards, Moctezuma said quietly, I welcomed you as a god returning to this land, yet you are destroying us. My people are angry. They have chosen another to be king when I die, and they have made up their minds not to let you leave this palace alive. I can no longer help you. Nevertheless, he tried to end the fighting by climbing to the roof to speak to his people. He told them that if they stopped their attack, the Spaniards would leave Mexico. An angry person in the crowd threw some stones at Moctezuma. Suddenly, many people were throwing stones, and Moctezuma fell. The Spaniards laid him out on a mat, but he refused their doctor's help. In a cell of his family's palace, the king of the Aztecs' son died in pain and sorrow. By custom, Aztec warriors did not fight at night. They removed the bridges from the causeways so no one could enter or leave the city, and went home to sleep. The Spanish soldiers secretly had been building a portable wooden span to use as a bridge. Night came, and the Aztecs left the palace courtyard and deserted streets. Rainfall darkened the sky and would muffle the sound of marching. The Spaniards took this chance to escape, knowing they might not get another. They loaded some of the Aztec gold onto horses and helped themselves to the rest of it. Carrying heavy weapons and weighted down with gold, the men moved quickly toward the causeway. At a gate, an Aztec sentry saw them and shouted in alarm. At the first gap in the causeway, the Spaniards lowered their wooden bridge. It held strong as the parade of soldiers, horses, and cannons crowded across. But Aztecs were behind them, running toward them from the city. They were sliding through the water in hundreds of canoes. Yelling for room to work, the Spanish crews pulled and tugged at the bridge to lift it up, but it was stuck. Aztecs were bumping their canoes into the side of the causeway, climbing out and jumping onto the bridge. Thousands of warriors attacked the Spaniards and pushed them forward. 
Those Spaniards at the front of the line shouted for the soldiers to bring up the bridge, but the men at the end of the line were fighting and shoving and pushing and pulling. In the bitter struggle, both Aztecs and Spaniards fell off the edge of the causeway into the water, but the Aztecs were not weighted down with gold and could swim. So many men died and sank into the water where the bridge should have been. The last Spaniards crossed over the gap on drowned bodies. The Aztecs did not follow them to shore. They took the Spanish wounded and captured to sacrifice to their gods. Near the bloodied causeway, Cortez sat in the rain under a cypress tree and wept. He had lost most of his men and his horses and the golds. Spaniards who wrote down the story of that night in Spain's terrible losses called the escape from Tecnoticlan the sad night. But many Aztec eagle knights and many jaguar knights also died that night. The Aztecs did not know that this was the last battle that they would win. A year later, Cortes with his men marched back with more cannons and more men. With the help of the Tuscalan people, they built a small fleet of ships, which were then taken apart and carried piece by piece over the mountains. The ships were reassembled at the lakeshore. This time, the Spaniards fought the Aztecs to the ground and conquered the city. The ancient stone pyramids and temples were torn down. Spaniards forced Aztec slaves to build churches and public buildings on top of their ruins, including the same stones. Some of those buildings are still there today. Tecnoctitlan is now called Mexico City, the largest city in the world. It is no longer an island, and the lakes and streets of water have dried up. A few years ago, workers digging in the city for a new subway found three bars of gold. Experts studied them and saw traces of melted-down jewelry from Moctezuma's treasure that was lost in the lake. Almost 500 years after the sad night, the president of Mexico and the ambassador from Spain met as friends in a great museum in Mexico City to inspect the gold bars. Over that building in the heart of the city waves the flag of Mexico. The people who give their allegiance to this flag speak Spanish, the language of Cortes. Yet on that flag is this design, an eagle perched on a cactus on a rock with a snake in its beak.